Sustainable fashion. I've never heard that word in my life. That's hard. Like, I don't even know what sus sustainable means. Like, affordable? Sustainable fashion means to me something that's lasting or that could be reused. Nice looking fashion. Without using the word sustainable? I have no idea. Not even a clue. Conserving your clothing. Environmentally friendly? That's how it means. Welcome to Behind the Seams, a transparent look into the world of fashion. Hosted by Anne Price, Emily Burns, and Michaela Albright. It's funny that like people people couldn't define what sustainability was because the entire time people were defining it, I was trying to think of my own definition. And I think I came up with something. Can I run it past you guys? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, sus my definition of sustainable fashion would be the choice to present yourself in a way that does no harm to the environment or other human beings or people while still maintaining, or animals, also maintaining a unique form of self-expression and identity. That's really interesting. I think it's so hard to define it. And someone was asking me today, well, what does it mean, Michaela? And I was just sitting there like, oh my God, there's so much I want to say. What do I say first? What's concise? What's a sentence or two that I could explain it? Right. And then you're kind of talking about, you start thinking about like the four pillars, like the economic, the environmental, the social, the emotional. And then you want to define all of that. But then you also want to talk on the point that it's not about just not harming things it's about feeding our people feeding our environment and like having this whole cycle of production be replenishing as well so it's like how do you even put that into one sentence it's like when you have a company that takes down one tree and replants one other tree that's not enough you need to replant 10 trees you need to really make it sustainable really make it better in the end. We don't want to just stay the same. We want to have economic growth, environmental happiness, people's happiness. We not only need to do the bare minimum, but go a little bit above and beyond. After hours of debating what the strongest definition of sustainable fashion might be, we came up with a collective definition that sustainable fashion is the fostering of self-expression through the conscious consumption and transparent production of renewable goods that are sourced ethically and efficiently by replenishable human, technological, and natural resources. So what does that really mean? So basically, sustainable fashion is the development, purchasing, and wearing of clothes in a way that does no harm to the environment or the people who make them while simultaneously feeding our economy and our personal sense of identity. In order to truly digest the concept of sustainable fashion, it's easiest to break it down amongst its four pillars, the environmental, economic, social, and the often forgotten emotional. So all four pillars really address two aspects, the large scale and the small scale implications. So for the first pillar, environmental, we're really looking at the industry as well as the government's responsibility to conserve natural resources throughout every point of the supply chain um, while the government is enforcing regulations to ensure the preservation of um, these finite resources on Earth and really putting a cap on pollution, limiting pollution. So how do we make that? more digestible. Basically, industry shouldn't let the byproduct of their production or their products affect the environment, and really the government needs to regulate their actions. Exactly. They can't just sit back and let the industries do whatever they please. They need to step in if they're not being responsible about their environmental impact. But there's also a small-scale aspect which really focuses on the consumer's responsibility to be conscious of their purchases and respect the environment through inform consumption, the use and disposal of their goods. Exactly. We can't just go and buy whatever we want and throw it away. There's a shocking figure. 68 pounds of textile waste are thrown away each year for each and every American. All right, 68 pounds. We're talking about the weight of a 10-year-old child. That's even more weight than you're legally allowed to lift for a job, at least for my jobs that I've had in Vermont. And when you think about it, it's 68 pounds for 318 million people. So if you really think about the the scale of 
te- just textile waste alone from one country out of hundreds in the world. You can imagine how detrimental this could be to the environment. And, you know, the fashion industry has been so successful. It's a $3 trillion industry. Of course there's going to be waste. How are consumers dealing with that? How is industry dealing with that? How is government stepping in and dealing with that? So I would say that the next pillar would have to be the economic pillar of sustainable fashion. And in terms of the large scale, that refers to an industry's ability to engage in production and trade of goods through conservation and also the development of natural resources and human capital as well to create a system that really encourages a long-term stable economy. All while like domestic and international regulations and standards are established by governments to maintain this economic stability that we so desperately need, especially now. Yeah, so basically in other words, like it, it's simply like conducting research and development to create a healthy economy and that focuses on the long term and not just the quarterly profits, which really is focusing on the short term. And when you really think about it, it's focusing on short term pain and a long term gain. And, you know, we use this phrase so much in our society. But when you think about the way that the economy has been for so long now is really short term gain with long term negative implications. And we need to find a way as a society to really flip that. It's like college. It pays to invest in the future. And bringing it back to small scale, talking about the individual, but also the consumer as an individual and their obligation to purchase responsibly and efficiently in terms of their own personal budget, really being able to seek alternatives to fast fashion that are really going to satisfy their needs for fashion, refraining from, you know, overspending, um, spending in general even, Um, And focusing more on supporting, you know, secondary markets, thrifting is like surged in the past 10 years um, or support or supporting like local um, economies and repurposing items from, you know, the thrift store, getting a dress, trimming it, getting a pair of jeans, trimming them off and making cutoffs. Even repurposing things that you already own, bring something to a tailor if it no longer fits you, if jeans no longer fit you, cut them into shorts. Exactly. Um, People need to learn there are many alternatives to fast fashion that you shouldn't be supporting something like fast fashion when it doesn't support you in return in terms of like your wallet um in any good relationship people look for balance and you know you have to give a little to get a little so generally the third pillar of sustainable fashion is considered to be the social pillar Um, And when looking at this from a larger scale, um, it's considered to be the industry and the government's overall accountability in protecting and guaranteeing basic human labor and compensation rights to all workers. Um, And that really uh, stresses the fact that it's throughout each level of the supply chain. And how to do this is to implement regulations and standards that protect these rights globally and domestically. You know, we're talking about all governments, not just U.S. government, not just government abroad, really all governments implementing these standards and regulations for their workers. In the most basic terms, it's paying employees fair and living wages while taking responsibility for not only their lives, but their general safety. And when you think about this, um, a lot of the time when we think about the fashion industry, we think about the people in the corporate offices, we think about the sales associates working retail, but we don't often think about the garment workers behind these products that we rely on every single day for our fashion choices and for just basic necessities of clothing. Um, And oftentimes, unfortunately, these workers are not being paid fair or living wages. Um, They don't receive enough money to even get by um, to take care of themselves, nonetheless their children. Um, And a lot of times it's not even safe for them to go to work and be exposed to these conditions. And you know what's interesting is we have these government regulations already. So now when you buy a garment in the U.S., it's required to have the country of origin, it's required to have the fiber content. But not everyone looks at those tags when they buy something. And sometimes when you go and you shop and you look at the thing and it says made, made in Bangladesh, if you really stop and you think about that, that person is living on, you know, what is it, like $2 a day? That's not a living wage. I mean, we're already struggling in the U.S. with our 7.25 minimum wage. Think about what $2 can get you in a whole day. It's a really unrealistic wage. This really brings forth the smaller scale aspect of 
the social pillar, um, the consumer's responsibility to actively observe and gain knowledge regarding the items that they plan to purchase. Look at that garment tag and be aware of the well-being of the people that are behind that label. In other words, if you cannot locate the country found on the country of origin label, or let alone, you know, pronounce it, consider what else, you know, you don't know about the person who made your clothes. So now we've really talked about the environmental pillar, the economic pillar, and the social pillar. These three ideas are drawn together to form the triple bottom line. This is something that, you know, a benefit corporation or sustainable company operates and uses this idea of incorporating these three things, not just the economic. But there's a huge fourth pillar that really is missing in this triple bottom line, something that's really important to sustainable fashion, and that's the emotional pillar. Within the emotional pillar, there are also large and small scale aspects. However, the large is one that kind of flies under the radar of our awareness. It's almost at a subconscious level. It's the industry's power that they have over consumer purchasing habits through the use of marketing to form these perceptions in our mind of status, quality, price, and style within their products. Yeah, it's really, you know, the industry's ability and just complete power over the consumer to dictate what, you know, we purchase. Um, and they really kind of play into the insecurities of the consumer and create a need, literally create a need. The definition of marketing from our marketing class is to create a void in the consumer, to create something they need. And with that, you know, there comes the small scale application. Um, and that really within sustainable fashion is the relationship and mutuality of respect between consumers and their goods. And we believe that this is fostered through the understanding that goods serve the personal identities of the consumers. You know, the lifespan of goods is dependent on consumers' actions, but it's also dependent on our emotions. And both of those lead to our purchasing power in the end. It's like fashion, it's our chosen skin. In other words, you know, it's an extension of our identity and it should make us feel happy, make us feel secure and express really who we are. You know, we have deep emotional connections with our clothing. Like we had previously said in the economic pillar, it's about getting clothes that support you. Fast fashion won't always support you because it's going to end up falling apart. It's going to end up not looking amazing after one wash and you need that almost mutual respect, as we said before, between you and your clothes. It's a relationship. It's not just a piece of fabric. You really don't want your clothes to betray you, and that's what cheap, inexpensive, bad clothing is doing to us. As heard in our opening segment, people are clearly unaware of the meaning behind sustainable fashion. And our goal is to explain, to raise awareness, and to inspire the public to take action. So why do we care? My entrance into the world of sustainable fashion, I believe, started with the beginning of my college career. I loved fashion and I felt like this was the right major for me. It was what I was going to do. And I felt like the second I actually started taking classes in fashion, there was something missing for me. I felt not totally attached to fashion like I had felt before. Um, I'd seen all my classmates go through the different courses and they seemed so passionate about it and there was something that I didn't feel passionate about. There was something that I thought maybe this was my hobby but not necessarily my love and it only really changed when I studied abroad in Paris and I had this incredible product development professor who was from Czechoslovakia and she was just completely engrossed in sustainable fashion and it was never really something that was brought to my attention. Yes, I knew about workers being exploited, but I didn't really know the intensity of the impact that the fashion industry has on the environment, on these people and their true welfare, on the economy and on our emotional capacity. And once I started learning about the complexities of fashion, did I become so enamored by this industry and enamored with the possibility that I could be a part of 
this industry's change. So sustainable fashion to me is something that is inevitable. It is something that is a part of the evolution of this world. And I think that I don't really have a choice but to be involved in it. For me, sustainability in fashion had always kind of been part of my life since I was young. I would go thrift shopping with my mom. But I think when it really started to change how I acted was when I was embarking on my college search. And I was completely conflicted as to whether or not I should study fashion. It was something I was really passionate about or if I should study environmental science because I had this deep craving to help the environment and help people um, and become kind of an activist. And so these two are kind of, it's kind of an oxymoron to think that you can put them together. Um, but in my senior project in, in high school, I realized that I could put the two together through sustainable fashion. I did a project on fashion styling and photography. And then, of course, spending my freshman year abroad, it only reiterated it by spending time in Italy and seeing how the European culture incorporates sustainability, less is more, quality over quantity, things that I had already learned about in my senior project. And it was only strength and deeper when um, I attended a showing of the True Cost documentary with Anne and Emily and realized that this is something that is that, that students like us, fashion majors embarking on the industry, need to work towards. It needs to work towards sustainable fashion. It is the future. We will not have careers in 10 years if this is not incorporated. For me, it was kind of different. I've always been aware of sustainability and its impacts on the world, but I've never really had it directly impact me until I was put in this group. And almost like our episode, Out of Sight, Out of Mind, it was really hard for me to personally connect with it and hard to take seriously because it wasn't always right in front of me. It wasn't always thrown in my face. Whereas here, I'm researching it. I'm learning about it. I'm surrounded by two of the most sustainable, inspiring people I know. And... Since I've started, I've really noticed a difference in myself and a change in my purchasing behavior that I'm more proud of. After weeks of brainstorming and collaborating on how to best execute our knowledge of sustainable fashion, we finally settled on the concept of creating a podcast that would raise awareness of the issues facing the fashion industry and illuminate the path to change. We accomplished this undertaking through a series of 54 interviews with industry professionals and Marist College students, faculty, and professors across a variety of disciplines, thus broadening our expertise and scope on these issues. Throughout our process, we are extremely troubled by the many misunderstandings of sustainable fashion that we came across. We're here to defy the misconception that the fashion industry and its consumers will never be able to incorporate sustainability into practice. We're here to change the mindset that being sustainable is too expensive, boring, unattractive, unattainable, or just for tree huggers. We're here to illustrate that fashion can be globally inclusive, environmentally, economically, socially, and emotionally. Before listening to the next episode of Behind the Seams, organize your closet. Doing so will help you realize what you have, what you don't have, what you need, and what you really don't need. Next, sit down with a bowl of popcorn and watch the True Cost documentary. It changed our lives, now let it change yours. If you're interested in learning more, follow us on Instagram at Behind the Seams Podcast or visit our website at thefold.marist.edu slash behind the seams. For further questions, email us at behind the seams podcast at gmail.com. This episode of Behind the Seams was produced by Michaela Albright, Ann Price, and myself, Emily Burns. We would like to thank Wayne Price for our original song, Michael Garino and Marist College IT for website development, Melissa Halverson for Capstone Advising, the participating students at Marist College, and the Marist College Fashion Department and Capstone Advising Committee.